Are we all here? Uh, Peacock? Present. Granger? Present. Slocum? I'm here. Just say present. Well, if I'm here, I must be present, mustn't I? Humphreys? Present and correct. <laughs> Brahms? Here. Lucas? Present! <laughs> now, the reason for this parade is that people have been tinkering with the time book. If the record is to be believed, those present yesterday included Errol Flynn, <laughs> whose handwriting is not dissimilar to Mr. Lucas's, and uh, Oscar Wilde. <laughs> His name, for your future reference, Mr. Humphreys, should be spelt with an E. I've already admonished the miscreants. Uh, yes, but it needs somebody with more authority to drive it home. Now, one expects this sort of thing in kitchenware and do-it-yourself, but not in ladies' and gentlemen's fashions. Will that be all, sir? No, no. There's one more thing. Today is Monday. Thanks for telling us. <laughs> Allow me to continue, Mr. Lucas. Friday is a landmark in the history of Grace Brothers. On that day, young Mr. Grace becomes an octogenarian. Does that mean he's not allowed to eat meat? <laughs> that means he will be 80 years old. And a fine age, if I may say so. I hope I shall be as active when I'm 80. Well, that's hardly likely. You're not as active as he is now. <laughs> well, the point is, I think that this floor should do something special for him to commemorate this notable event. I know I only have to throw the problem into your laps for you to come up with some cracking ideas. <laughs> yeah, well, don't say anything now. Give it some thought, formulate some ideas, and I'll use my expertise to pick a winner. What would we do without you at the helm, sir? <laughs> uh, well, there's a bell. Off we go, off we go. Come on, sir. Fifteen pounds. Is that your commission? Yeah. What did you do this week? Four vests, one pair of gloves, one Bermuda shorts and a returned overcoat. <laughs> At this rate, I'd do better to leave and live on assistance. If you don't improve on that, you better. Yeah, yeah, there's a customer. Go on, let me have him. Well, by rights, as your senior, I should have him. But your story has touched my heart, mm -hmm. so go on, you can have him. Yeah, good morning, sir. Can I help you? I'd like a handkerchief, please. It's <laughs> 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 my luck, isn't it? Thank you for your custom, madam. Now, in this bag, we have the Scarlet Undy Fun Set, consisting of mini bra, waspy corset, can-can pants, suspender belt, and, of course, the black stockings. There we are. And in this bag, we have the same in fluorescent green. <laughs> Will Madam be requiring a bill? Oh, yes, for my income tax. I use them for my business. Oh, what sort of business are you in? Oh. That'll do, Miss Brown. <laughs> <laughs> there you are, madam. Merci. Bon chance. Bye-bye. That dog looked awfully tired to me. I expect it does a lot of walking. <laughs> Whew, well, that's not a bad sale. Over 60 quid. That's just over three pounds commission. That's more than I've done all week. Oh, well, when I retire, you'll be the senior and then you'll have first crack of the whip. But that means waiting until you're 60. Blimey, that's... Be careful how you add up, Miss Brown. <laughs> <laughs> Why, that's almost 30 years. <laughs> now, you're flattering me just a teeny bit. <laughs> but you're a bright girl. <laughs> oh, good morning, sir. Can I help you? Uh, do you sell fur coats? Well, yes, we have quite a large range. Good. As a matter of fact, I want two. One for my wife and one for a friend. I'll just get my junior to get the rail. Did you hear that? He wants two fur coats. You can't put a foot wrong, can you? Look, I'll tell you what. Since you've been so nice to me, I'll split this sale with you. I'll take the commission on the wife's coat and you can have commission on her friends. Oh, thanks. About what price range did you have in mind, sir? Well, in my wife's case, say about uh, 200 pounds. Oh, what a nice present. Can I have the key, Mrs Slocum? We have to take precautions with luxury merchandise. There's a lot of nicking goes on. <laughs> Something in the region of £200 for the customer's wife. Is it her birthday, may one ask? No, it's going to be a surprise. Oh, if only there were more gents about the likes of you. 
Now, this one is 190 in simulated mink. Very nice. Okay. About what build is Madam? Actually, rather like yours, stoutish. <laughs> <laughs> in the trade, we call it Juno-esque. <laughs> Would you try it on for me? Oh, Miss Brahms? Oh, when a woman puts on a fur coat, the years just drop away. In my wife's case, they'd have a long way to drop. <laughs> you look a real treat in it, Mrs Slocum. There you are, an unbiased opinion. Yes, yes, I'll take it. Oh, thank you, sir. Sail to me, Miss Brown. It's your lucky day. <laughs> Never mind, you get the commission on the next one. Now, for your wife's friend, may I suggest this dyed um, coney? It's specially reduced to 40 pounds. Well, uh, actually, it's not my wife's friend. No, oh, no. No, it's uh, for my friend. No, oh, yes. <laughs> I'm afraid we have nothing cheaper than that. Well, on the contrary, I expect to spend a couple. Oh, a couple of hundred. She must be a very old friend. A couple of thousand. Oh, she must be a very young friend. <laughs> well, actually, she's my uh, girlfriend. <laughs> This genuine ranch mink, 2,100. Very nice. Uh, would you mind putting it on? You have rather similar features. <laughs> of course, real mink on a very young girl can look dead common. <laughs> um, don't you think you might be better to give this to your wife and the simulate it to your bit of fluff? <laughs> no. Now, how long have you been married? 20 years. How many children? Four. Do you mean to say that poor woman has given you the best years of her life? <laughs> and all those children and all she gets in exchange is this 190 quid rabbit. <laughs> well, she that does nothing but wiggle her assets on your night off. <laughs> comes for the 2,000 pound jackpot. Just a minute. What about all the time I spend sitting alone waiting for him to get away from you? <laughs> <laughs> Story. You think I don't know, don't you? Just because I smile and put a good face on it. But it's here that it hurts. <laughs> when I look into the faces of my little children, I say him. And I think that all those years that we've struggled together. Yes, but you've had him for 20 years. He's bored with you. That's why he comes to me. I'll make him feel young again. Don't you think you're getting away with this? The minute I saw this... Cheap imitation. Oh, yes. I said to myself, right, monkey. <laughs> if found somebody else, I'm putting five detectives on you when I'm going to my solicitors first thing in the morning. You're quite right. That's exactly what she'll say. Cancel the coat for my wife. It will give the game away. I'll just take the coat for my miss... Girlfriend. <laughs> That's over hundred pound commission for me. Oh no, it isn't. We're splitting fifty-fifty. The wife gets half the estate. <laughs> There's a seat for you at the end of the table, Mr. Granger. Yeah, come along, come along over here. You haven't brought a spoon, Mr. Granger. No. I'm fed up with your complaining about the noise that I make when I'm drinking my soup. So I brought some straw. <laughs> what have you got all those for? Well, they melt. The, the, the soup makes them soggy. <laughs> oh. It's like being on a North Sea oil rig when they're struck lucky. <laughs> Wagon onion, luckers, salt beef, gefilte fish, and bagels. Are you changing your religion? <laughs> My mother saw Moses on the television last night. <laughs> thought Bert Lancaster looked so fit and manly, the diet might do me good. There's a mountain village in Russia where they all live to be 130. Yes, I read about that. They eat a lot of vegetables and put yak butter in their tea. And what's more, they remain very virile right up to the end. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Granger drew my attention to that. <laughs> I should stick a pack of margarine in your minestrone and pop over to that. <laughs> While we're on the subject of the aged, I think we ought to turn our thoughts to young Mr. Grace's 80th birthday. Well, why do we have to think about it? It's our turn. Catering did him last year. 
Well, of course, they went too far. It should have been obvious that a topless go-go dancer leaping out of a cake would have been a terrible shock for a man of his age. That was his second heart attack, wasn't it? His first one was when Mr Lucas phoned up, said he was Hugh Fraser, and how much did he want for the shop? Well, he should have known that a scantily clad young girl would have that effect. Yeah, it's a pity. If you'd volunteered, Mrs Slocum, you could have saved him six months in hospital. <laughs> me doing that. No, you wouldn't get in the cake. <laughs> All this is getting us nowhere. Look, what we are looking for is a fitting tribute. Something like the victory parade for uh, Churchill and the King. Mm. What about that teleprogram where they get somebody famous and they show pictures of them in little short trousers and they end up shaking hands with Danny LaRue? <laughs> <laughs> when I saw that, I didn't like it. <laughs> Nevertheless, you may have the germ of an idea there. You know, we could do, here is your shop, and show his rise from rag trade to riches. Yeah, but wouldn't it be a lot of work finding all that out? Yes, and all the other departments would have to come in on it as well. Why, why don't we call it, here is your department, and confine it to the way young Mr Grace has affected all our lives, and throw in a bit of his, his early history as well? Yeah, but how do we find it all out? Well, I know quite a lot. I met him one day in 1926 on a bus. Well, when his car had broken down. Oh, yeah. I can see it all now. Does this voice mean anything to you? <laughs> Fairs, please, plenty of room. <laughs> yes, you're right. That is the very actual conductor. Here he is, 127 years old. <laughs> We've flown him in especially from a tribe in a little village in Russia. <laughs> Here he is, being virile all over the place with yak buttons. <laughs> <on his head. laughs> Well, I, I hardly think we have those travel facilities at our command. Here, I couldn't help overhearing your conversation, seeing as how I've been listening to every word. <laughs> and I can put your mind at rest that your travels are at an end, cos for the last two years he's been writing his memoirs. Well, how do you know that, Harmon? I've been helping him make them up. <laughs> got them by the side of his desk. All someone's got to do is nick them. Oh, don't look at me. I mean... But I can be counted on to help you out with any undercover operation. I thought you were supposed to be the one undercover. Shut up. Hey, Mr. Grace. Your tea. Oh, Mr. Harmon, you've forgotten the biscuit. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Doing what? Pinching my bottom. It sounds like me. Yes? <laughs> yes? Good, good. Well, start Mr. Grace towards the lift in one minute. Ah, everything said at your end, Peacock? Definitely, sir. Uh, Mr. Lucas obtained young Mr. Grace's memoirs about four days ago, and he tells me that he's managed to unearth some magnificent background material with particular emphasis on the way young Mr. Grace has affected the lives of the members of this department. Well, young Mr. Grace will be coming up from the bargain basement. Good. And Mr. Lucas is set up in the boardroom to surprise him, so we'd uh, better get up there with all speed, because uh, then we can be ready to come in when we need it. Right, is it working? Running? OK. Right. I'm standing in the boardroom of Grace Brothers' store. <laughs> <laughs> Is that well-known department store. Now, any minute now, coming through that door there is a man who has no inkling at all of the tribute that's about to be paid to him. Limited. Hey, what are you talking about? Limited. Grace Brothers Limited. Well, never mind that. Is it running? Oh, yeah. Really well, funny. shut up then. I mean, we've got to give him this tape afterwards. Have we? Yeah. Oh, uh, I, Mr. Armand, and the man of the department worship that man. Shut up! <laughs> He thinks that he's coming up here to interview this new secretary. Here he is. I'm going to hide myself behind the screen now and we'll see what happens. <laughs> here is your new secretary. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, very nice. Yes. <laughs> Leave us alone. Oh, well. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're a 
pretty little thing, aren't you? Well, my shorthand speed is 120 and my typing is 60. Yeah, very good. Uh, never mind about that. Well, what are your measurements? <laughs> well, 38, 22, 36. You've got the job. <laughs> oh, Mr. Grace, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but this is not a real secretary at all. No, this girl is just a decoy brought here for one reason only. Blackmail? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Mr. Grace. So that we can pay a tribute to you of your achievements. Mr. Grace, here is your department. D don't worry, it's like that television show where they show some famous person starts off wearing short trousers and ends up shaking hands with Danny LaRue. Yeah, I saw that. Didn't like it. Um. <laughs> Our story begins in a humble back street in the East End of London in the year 1897. Here lived Henry Grace and his wife, Ethel. <laughs> this devoted couple was born a bouncing baby boy. <laughs> Although born of a long line of cobblers, <laughs> destiny had ordained a different fate for this wee lad. Not for him, the cobbler's last. Now, he was impatient to get away from his environment. I'm not surprised those fur rugs tickle something off. <laughs> and from this humble home, he went to this humble school. Now, standing there... <laughs> standing there as that pinch-faced urchin there, Mr. Grace. Now, what thoughts were passing through your mind? I mean, did you have any idea that one day you'd become a millionaire? Well, no, my braces said bust, and I was keeping the trousers. <laughs> Yes, sir, no doubt. No, little did you know what an important part trousers were going to play in your life. <laughs> but that is still in the future. Leaving your school, you obtained a job which straight away made you stand apart from your fellow man. Yes, you became an apprentice haddock filleter. <laughs> I think it would make him stand apart. All day long, you wielded your filleting knife and would you believe it, Mr. Grace, we have found in Grace Brothers' kitchen this very knife, which is almost identical to something very similar. It's a very glamorous job, you know. My friend used to call me Fish Fingers. <laughs> but soon those Fish Fingers were to be pushing your very own fish barrel. And little did you know that in Folkestone, where some of that fish probably came from, a pram was being pushed along a not-so-very-different street. And in that pram was none other than Mr. Ernest Granger. Small world, isn't it? <laughs> and here is a picture of that very pram with that very Granger in it. <laughs> and here, believe it or not, to greet you in person, all the way from the first floor, is Mr. Ernest Granger. It was really Eastbourne, does it matter? No, 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 shut up, just stand. <laughs> I believe, Mr. Granger, you have uh, an amusing anecdote to tell about Mr. Grace. Indeed, I have. Yes, it was uh, in 1926. I remember, I boarded a number 11 bus and oh, yeah, I yeah. sat down and who should I see sitting next to me but you, you've guessed it, it was young Mr. Grace. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was... Uh... Embarrassed. Yes, I was. <laughs> yes. You see, I was only a junior and I wondered if I spoke if he would think I was being forward. But I needn't have worried, no. You know, he looked at me and he said, Good morning. And that's the kind of man he was. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Ernest Craig. That was very touching, Mr. Granger. <laughs> but we have jumped ahead in our story. Now, no sooner have you established yourself as an itinerant purveyor of filleted fish, when the war clouds gather, 
Without hesitation, you answer your country's call. <laughs> We didn't hang about in those days. <laughs> yes, without hesitation, you answer your country's call. And you give up your fish stall, and for four long years, you manufacture tin pilchards for the troops. <laughs> now, by an amazing coincidence, and after a lot of research, we have discovered being served in this very canteen those same tin pilchards. <laughs> Not one not. <laughs> I can tell you, the army bought a lot of those in the last war, too. And also, by a coincidence, there is here, Mr. Gray, somebody this evening who was also in that army, who might very well have eaten those very same pilchards. Yes, Corporal, later to become Captain Stephen Peacock. <laughs> Captain Peacock has an amusing anecdote. Oh, yes, indeed I have, yes. I well recall one cruel January morning. i just missed my bus, and I was standing there blowing into my gloves to bring the circulation back to my hands when a large Rolls Royce drew up beside me. The door opened, and there sat young Mr. Grace, beckoning to me. Forfeiting my place in the queue, I went across to him. Don't worry, he said. There'll be another one along in a minute. <laughs> With a cheery wave, he slammed the door and drove off. <laughs> and that's how I shall always remember, Mr. Grace. Never too busy to stop and give a word of hope and encouragement. Thank you, Captain Stephen Peacock. <laughs> but we are ahead of our story. We left you in 1918, still canning pilchard. And for eight long years, you tried your hand at this, that, and quite a bit of the other. <laughs> And until your hard work and determination and your will to succeed finally paid off. Yes, a remote uncle left you Grace Brothers in his will. That was in the year 1926. By a coincidence almost beyond belief, this very same actual year marked the birth of none other than Rachel Yiddle. Yeah. I see surprise and bewilderment chase across your face. Well, perhaps this photograph will help you. <laughs> yes, you've guessed it. Miss Rachel Yiddle, later to become Mrs. Slocum. And now, Mr. Grace, does this voice remind you of anything? I've pressed everything in sight and I still can't make it go up or down. You haven't found that young secretary I had in 56, have you? <laughs> no, Mr. Grace. <laughs> no, it's the voice of Shirley Browns. And here she is. Now, I believe you both have an amusing anecdote to tell. Indeed, we have. There was me and Miss Browns with young Mr. Grace in this lift. And it got stuck fast. Yes, I pressed all the buttons and I still couldn't shift it. And I got ever so frightened. And would you believe it, young Mr Grace cuddled her for half an hour while I shouted for help. <laughs> <laughs> and when the engineers finally arrived to rescue us, he was as cool as a cucumber. Don't worry about me, he said. Save Mrs Slocum. And then come back for me and the bird later. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the sort of man he is. Thank you, Shirley Browns and Rachel Yiddle. <laughs> so, as you can see, Mr. Grace, the long arm of coincidence has always played a great part in your life. But we can't go, we can't leave without one final coincidence. That'd be down in the room. <laughs> Does this voice mean anything to you? I'm free. <laughs> it's the one with the funny walk. <laughs> Right, right first time, Mr. Grace. You've guessed it, and here he is, the master of the snug fit, Mr. Wilberforce Claiborne Humphrey. I won't kiss you, I've got a bit of a cold. 
Now, I believe you've got an amusing anecdote to tell Mr. Humphreys about uh, Mr. Grace's ability to make a quick decision. Oh, I have. When I first came here for a job, I went into Mr. Grace's office and I said, my name is Humphreys, I'm young and I'm willing. Mr. Grace stood up, he raised his hand, he said, Mr. Humphreys, say no more. We don't want your sort here. <laughs> but nevertheless, five days later, you were employed by Grace Brothers. And only Mr. Grace knows the reason for that change of mind. Well, it was because of someone who was very dear to you, probably the greatest friend you ever had, and you know who that was. Oh, oh no, it couldn't be him. They'd never give him a day off from Lily White's. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, then let's have a look at this picture and let it remind you. Oh, it's Mother. <laughs> yes. Indeed, let her tell her story in her own words. We've not brought her here. It's a day for bingo. Hello, Mr. Grace. I'm sorry I can't be with you, but it's my day for bingo. <laughs> I shall never forget the time my little lad came back from his interview at Grace Brothers. Although he stuck his chin out and he didn't cry, he was heartbroken. Mothers can tell, you know. <laughs> Later that night, I peeped in on him. There he was, clutching his teddy bear, with tears on his cheeks. He cried himself to sleep. Oh, Mother, don't go on. <laughs> the following day, he was busy with his crochet work, and I sneaked out and I came to see you, Mr. Grace. I threw myself down on my knees in front of your desk, and I said, look at me. You're looking at a mother with a broken heart. Oh, mother, you didn't. <laughs> He's a good, kind boy. Oh, she's right. He's loving. Um, he'd bend over backwards to help anybody. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Give him a chance, I said. And you smiled at me over your ink well. Don't get your knickers in a twist, you said. I'll give him a try. Do you know, I was so grateful. I threw my arms round your neck and I kissed you. You didn't. She did. <laughs> and the rest is history. Once you came under Mr. Grace's hand, you never looked back. In fact, none of us ever looked back. Mr. Grace. But what about me? Well, I expect you were too boring. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Grace, here is your department. <laughs>